from the News Channel 5 Network, this is Morning Line with Nick Barris. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Morning Line. Nick Barris here on a Thursday and uh, very excited about this morning's show about a very serious topic. Um, we're going to be talking about forensic scientists uh, as it relates to criminal investigations and also looking at, you know, some of the situation with the materials they use, for instance, rape kits. And it's in the news again, the huge backlog of cases where the rape kits have yet to be tested, where they've been able then to use that evidence to make an arrest. And uh, most recently highlighted, of course, in the case of Eliza Fletcher, where the suspect in that case was already under investigation for a potential rape prior to his attack, allegedly, on Eliza Fletcher. And because the rape kit never got processed, they never were able to get him into custody. And so he was free then to go and commit other crimes. That's part of the issue. If you want to crack down on sex crimes, what you have to do is move quickly on these rape kits, not have a huge backlog for whatever that reason is, and then get these individuals in custody so they don't commit crimes further ahead into the future. So we're going to talk about that. And this is very, uh, I think, uh, a great opportunity for us with our guest this morning, who's going to be speaking at uh, MTSU um, uh, later tonight at 630 at the Union Ballroom there. We're going to be joined in the name you may recognize. He basically is one of, if not the world's foremost forensic uh, scientist. Um, he's testified in so many cases. Most people became familiar with the name uh, Dr. Henry Lee, dating back to the O. J. Simpson trial, of which he was a part of. He also worked on the Lacey Peterson case, the John Bonet Ramsey case, Chandra Levy, uh, Elizabeth Smart, um, has uh, participated in many of the investigations and examinations into the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Um, one of the foremost experts, I guess, and he's here in town talking, among other things, about this whole backlog with uh, the rape kits and the like, and that again is uh, Dr. Henry Lee, who's joining us by Skype right now from MTSU. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Nick. Good to see you. It's very good to have you on with us, and we appreciate it. You know, if you would, uh, being one of the world's foremost experts on this, uh, because of so many high-profile cases you've been involved with, can you, for um, the viewers, kind of lay out what it is a forensic scientist like you does? You know, the real basic part of it when it comes to criminal investigations. What is the role of a forensic scientist? Okay, uh, you probably know I have a long career. I started my law enforcement forensic science career 64 years ago. Early days, in 1950s, and uh, police, we solved the cases by interrogation and confession. Then by 60s, 70s, we started utilize witnesses, uh, sting cooperation, undercover, uh, all of those. But by the 80s, one after another Supreme Court decision severely limit police to those uh, interrogation type of uh, uh, techniques. So we have to rely on forensic technology. Forensic technology, basically, we look at the crime scene, collect the physical evidence, analyze those physical evidence, provide a link to a suspect or exonerate an innocent person. Scientific evidence should be neutral. Doesn't take time. Sometimes the witness maybe have a misidentification or maybe some other reason give a wrong statement. The physical evidence itself should be uh, reliable, except the scientists examine those physical evidence uh, have to have a excellent standard, both technology, uh, also ethic standard. So when you talk about what that forensic evidence is, most people would think, and they all watch CSI and TV shows like that, forensic evidence, okay, physical evidence would be things like blood, semen, um, you know, skin, Things like this that, again, go, I guess, to DNA. Is DNA perhaps the most well-known form of forensic evidence? Yes, uh, Nick, uh, you're right. Our life, it's not like CSI. CSI, by second commercial, they have to come up a clue. Yeah. By last episode, they have to solve the case. Sure. Forensic evidence, actually, 
encompass the six different major areas, some called transient evidence. That category of evidence just appear momentarily uh, start changing or disappear. For example, when we go to a fire scene, when we get there, if we look at the fire, it's dark red. As seasoned forensic scientists, we can tell that's about 970 degree Fahrenheit. Sure. It's a cherry red. That's a little higher, hotter now, probably 11 to 1300 degree Fahrenheit. If a yellowish cherry red or bright color, that even higher. So you know, through the color of the fire, we can determine type of the accelerant or materials were burning. You know, I, I'll give you another example. Mm -hmm. For example, maggot. Uh, the size of the maggot can give us information how long the body been there. So that's called transient evidence. It changed with the time. The second category evidence called pattern evidence, such as like the blood pattern and uh, shoe print, uh, fingerprint, handwriting, uh, those are patterns. Then the third type is conditional evidence. When we get in there, television on, uh, is you, you're the watching your show, or uh, the microwave is running, the coffee pot still hot. Mm -hmm. um, Any time we also look at the water, water condition and the lighting condition, all those are conditioned. Um, the next type of evidence called transfer evidence. You just name quite a few, blood, DNA. Besides that, have hair, have chemicals, drugs, fertilizer, explosive, firearm. Those are falling into that category. The next category called electronic evidence. Huh. Your cell phone, CCTV camera, your uh, computer records, uh, then we have medical evidence. We look at a prescription drug or what this person had a um, toxic material during autopsy we can find. The last one called associated evidence, such as uh, uh, you have a shoulder care, you have a, a 2D labeling, all those we can trace uh, to the source of origin. So it's not like uh, CSI is uh, limited. Uh, a lot of uh, we do is beyond uh, uh, sure. ultra thinking, yes. Very, very broad field. And it, you mentioned about how the size of a maggot, okay, can give you an indication how long a body's been there. And it's, it's interesting, you happen to be at MTSU where you'll be speaking tonight, but uh, just down the road in Knoxville is where a friend of mine and a good colleague of yours, you know, started the body farm there, Dr. Bill Bass. And uh, both of you yeah. pioneers in that field, right? In terms of On what you body. learn from a decaying body. Ah, uh, yes, he, he's a wonderful man, a good leader, a good friend of mine. I met him about 30, 40 years ago. Wow. We work on some cases, and uh, I even uh, helped him translate uh, his book, Body Can Talk, become a uh, Chinese version. <laughs> it's a, a wonderful book. And, uh, uh, the younger four or six scientists can learn a lot. He, uh, we have a conversation the other day. He said if he feels caught up, Tonight, he's going to try to drive to uh, MTSU to attend the conference. Uh, that would be great if he could show up. You'd have in one room two of the foremost experts in the world on this kind of issue. And I can see how you two are friends. You obviously both have a real passion for learning about this type of thing. And I just think it's, uh, it's amazing. You know, we're going to take our first break in a moment. But let me ask you this. For a lot of people who followed, and it goes back a ways, but what was the forensic evidence in the O.J. Simpson case? Remind people of that, that you felt was pivotal. If we go back to maybe the most famous case in U.S. history. Yeah. Uh, we can all learn each case, every case, learn from the history. O.J. Simpson case, uh, they call trial of the century. 
in fact, just an ordinary case, except OJ and uh, Nicole, the victim and the suspect, uh, is high profile. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, uh, because their uh, uh, victim is Caucasian and the suspect uh, is American black, so you create a racial issue there. Then uh, you, somebody like O.J. Simpson, that time is rich enough, have enough resources to retain a lot of good lawyer, good forensic scientists to match the prosecution. So all of a sudden, this case become a trial of the century. Unfortunately, the crime scene start from the beginning, made some mistake. Mm -hmm. Often, people think forensics start from the laboratory. That's wrong. Forensic work start at the crime scene. If the potential evidence you did not recognize, that piece of evidence will never become evidence. If a piece of evidence was handled it wrong, yeah. wrong, or collected, did not protect it, right, that evidence is compromised. The result cannot be trusted. So the interpretation part is after the examination, with the result, with the crime scene, you put together. So interpretation, reconstruction, is another aspect of our forensic scientists. Yeah. You can't just develop a tunnel vision. From day one, moment one, say this person is guilty. If you do that, then you'll only look at the inculpatory evidence. Right. Inculpatory evidence, you don't, you start maybe intentional, maybe unintentionally, you don't pay much attention to it. Not go to effect the justice. That's the most valuable lesson we learned from that case. Gotcha. Listen, we're going to go to a break, but you're exactly right. Contamination of a crime scene. As a reporter, you know, we all go out to these locations when a crime scene occurs and they have crime scene tape up there. They don't let anyone in there. Hopefully before they put the crime scene tape up, you don't have people traipsing around touching things, as you say. Once that happens and if there's not chain of custody and all of this, it raises questions about was that evidence contaminated and it changes everything. That's why it's so crucial to leave things as they are until the experts like you can get in and start evaluating because the doctor there, of course, is correct, Dr. Lee, that uh, the investigation doesn't start in the lab. It starts at the crime scene. Look, we'll take a break, sir. And when we come back, we can take a few phone calls. If you have a question or comment, for our guest, and again, uh, most of you have probably heard of him if you follow these types of things, because he's probably one of the foremost experts in the world on this. We'll take those calls, but then we're going to get into this whole issue about the, the rape kits, the DNA testing, and the problems with the backlog, and why it's taking so long, and how this makes it difficult to go after these sex crime offenders. We'll take a break. Be back with the doctor right after this.